Hello everybody. Bienvenidos. Maligayang pagdating sa First World Manila Podcast. Buenos dias a todos. My name is Ramon Rodrigo Roberto Calao Cuenca, CFA. I am the founder and director of the First World Manila Podcast. Solving the Philippines' deep-rooted long-term problems. All right. Uh, today's episode is a quick one about nation building. Um, uh, and before we talk about that, I'd like to make a few annou- announcements regarding the podcast. The first is that I might be going bi-weekly with it, meaning every two weeks, uh, just because I want to focus, aside from my other businesses, I want to focus on um, my Instagram account for First of Manila. You can look it up uh, on Instagram, First of Manila, and also my Facebook account. Basically, because I draw and paint, I really want to also focus on the visual aspect uh, of this brand. You know, I mean, it's one thing, obviously, I want to be in all these, you know, touch points with listeners and consumers and people who just generally use the internet, people who consume media, basically. Um, and um, I've been focusing a lot on the podcast, but I'd, I'd like to make more use of what I originally started with, which was uh, paintings of a like it says, a first world Manila, because I find that that really gets to people as well. So it's the idea is to get people galvanized and and really care about uh, really fixing things here in the, in the Philippines. Um, second thing, also, if you are in the in the Philippines and you have something you want to talk about in my podcast, anything Philippine related, and you have a desire to help help this country in whatever way in whatever way you can. Please feel free to um, come and guest in my podcast. Uh, just send me an email. Drop me an email at admin at artandfinance.net. Admin, A-A-D-M-I-N, at artandfinance, A-R-T-A-N-D-F-I-N-A-N-C-E dot net. Admin at artandfinance.net. One more time. Uh, I will enunciate this time. Admin at art and finance that's one word dot net so if you're interested in uh guesting on my podcast if you want to get something off your chest or you want to talk about something you're doing to help the philippines or manila or anything related to those issues uh please feel free to contact me i'm always happy to get have a uh, guests on uh we had uh i had a great time with my first guest a few weeks ago joffrey balse who was talking about uh land uh land value tax for the philippines so it's always good to get other people's perspectives, and be be aware of our, be ready for more guests in the future. Okay, so going to the topic at hand: nation building and the Philippines. I want to read this article. So, as some of you, as some of you longtime listeners know, like my whole thing is um is really building a stronger sense of national identity for this country in order for us to really see each other as a nation. Um. I'd like to share an article related to that. Um, here we go. All right, this is um, How to Build a Nation by a very famous political scientist named Francis Fukuyama. So this is, I, I did a little Google search about nation, nation building because I wanted to see what people or influential thinkers thought about it. And this one really, um, I, I found to be very relevant to the, the discussions we've been having on this podcast. So, How to Build a Nation. This was, po- this was uh, published in the Harvard, the Harvard Gazette in 2012. So, I want to read to you um, a little excerpt from this. Okay. Francis Fukuyama dot dot dot. Uh, I want to skip some parts of this. Uh, said that external forces that can erect the skeleton of a state in, in an embattled country, creating police forces, administrative st- structures, and taxing authorities. So when, he, when this, what this writer means by state is basically a, like a government or a, a country or a nation. I mean, these are, these are uh, kind of fast and loose terms for most people, but the proper word in political science is state, 
right? It has like you know fixed borders and again taxing authorities and uh, and um, uh, coercive forces. So like having a police and the military, that's basically a state, all right. Um, and going on, let's go on to this. Okay. But nation building goes further and involves a shared sense of national identity built on elements that tie people together, such as shared culture, language, and history that cannot be imposed from without. So think about the Philippines, how this applies to the Philippines. We had these sort of what are called the, what are called the, the excuse me, what is called the apparatus of the state uh, pushed upon us through colonization, of course, uh, first with the Spanish and then the, the Americans. But there was no pre-existing you know, unified culture in this geography that is currently, it's called the Philippines. Uh, you had different you know, regional tribes and kingdoms, but nothing, nothing united. And um, as someone, I, I was reading some comments on Facebook, and I, as someone pointed out, like, if you go back in time, if you take a time machine and you went back in time to, I don't know, the 1400s, uh, would you say, I, I'm sure if you talk to, you know, the, the, tri, the, the people or the tribes of Lapu-Lapu or Raja Sulaiman or Datu Humabon, I, I, I don't think you, any, if you interviewed them, I don't think any of them would, can, would identify as being Filipino. So the problem is that like we have like the external features of a of a state, but not the internal ones in terms of uh, the external features being uh, quote unquote government institutions. I use uh, quotations there because it, well, how well they function is really up to you, up to your opinion. It's very questionable. Um, of course, the military and police force, uh, but internally, there's no uh, there's no sort of invisible glue binding us all together. So going on in this, um, in this um, article, Fukuyama provided an overview in which he said, he said large, diverse nations have a harder row to hoe in creating national identities. Nigeria is an example where little effort has been expended on nation building with resulting dysfunction and intergroup violence. While the United States is an example of a diverse nation where people feel a sense of national identity not because of shared ethnicity or long-standing cultural history, but because of a shared set of ideals. There we go. So that's interesting, I, I feel. Um, so different nations that are doing well have different glues binding them together, basically. Um, maybe in East Asian countries, it tends to be more, um, more uh, what the word is, racially homogenous, maybe it's, maybe it's ethnicity. But for a country like the United States, for example, which is racially heterogeneous, meaning that there are different you know, ethnicities living in the country, at its best, it's, uh, it, the, the ideals of the United States, um, um, I guess it's liberty, freedom, all, all the quotes. You can make it here, you can make it, uh, you can make it here, no matter where you're from in the world, immigration, things like that. Those are at best the ideals that bind people in the United States together. Um, so how do we apply this to the Philippines? Um, see, uh, this is the problem I felt, which is why I, I'm of the opinion that we got independence too early. I, if, if I was in a time machine, I would have I gone back to the 1800s and sided with uh, La Solidaridad and the Ilustrados. We should have been a province of Spain first and then consider independence later on. Um, we're not ready for that because there's no strong sense of identity. And I don't think the answer is, um, is ethnic identity because there was a really, really good, uh, really, really good uh, comic that someone put out about that. Like It's called Who is a Puri Pino? Uh, you know what? Why don't I look it up? Why don't I look, look for it now? Who is a pure Ipino? Here we go. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to pull this up now. And for those of you who are listening on, on, uh, on 
um, podcast, I will describe it to you. So who is Puripino? So if you look at this, it's a strip. Uh, there's several several uh, panels here. This is a great, you know, I'm going to post this on my Facebook page as well and on Instagram maybe just for reference for you guys. But basically, it's, a, it's sort of a repeating scene that's played out throughout the history of the Philippines. The first panel, you have the Malay person from sales, who sails to the Philippines for a, from a barangay and he's on the, lands on the beach, sticks his flag there, and he says, it's our turn. And then he's kind of has, has his foot on a Negrito. Because if you think about it, Negrito or Ayetna. Ayetna, is that the word? Ayetna people. Ayetna people. Ayetna or Ayet? Ayetna. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ayetna people. Ayetna. Not Ayetna. Ayetna is a corporation, sorry. <laughs> Ayetna people, right? It says, our turn. So this Malay conquer says, it's our turn. Then you have, a, I guess, a Muslim. Or, you know, I, I'm not sure which part of, of that part of the world he's from, but he says, it's our turn. Like, a, I guess, a Muslim from somewhere in the Middle East. Our turn. Then a Spaniard. Our turn. Then a Chinese pirate. And I guess this is Limahong. Right? Our turn. <laughs> then an American. Our turn. Yeehaw. Then Japanese. Our turn. He says, then there's a, I guess, uh, this is very interesting. There's a, uh, there's this picture here. You're less Filipino because you're mixed. I'm a full-blooded, pure Filipino. So this is why, uh, this is the problem here is that we're, in, in a way, we, we do talk about racial politics. And it's, it's not a very, we, 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 we tend, it's actually, the discussions we have about being Filipino is actually very racialized. And it's, it's, uh, it's definitely geared towards, like, um, predominantly Malay majority of people uh, who are poor, um, not necessarily the mestizo upper class. Um, and it's politically incorrect to, to say things like this, I think, because, uh, because we got democracy too early and we've pandered and, we've, and these uh, you know, crafty politicians who really don't care about the country will pander to the majority, the masa, the masa voting base. So this is the problem we have is that there's no strong sense of identity. A lot of it's just it's just uh, a lot of it is, is basically pandering to the masa. What what constitutes it being Filipino? And and I, I know this is maybe politically incorrect, but it's a truth. I'm, excuse me. I know this is politically incorrect, but it's the truth. Um, which is also why a lot of people are not inspired when they say they're Filipino, or they try to hide that they're Filipino when they're abroad. They don't talk about it, which is really sad because we have such a unique history that we have to market to ourselves. All right, as, I've, as many of you know, I repeat this over and over again. All right. So, but what what could unite us together? Here's what I want to talk about now, which is uh, something I want to, talk, I want to dedicate the, the rest of this episode to. What can what sort of invisible glue can put us together? Because uh, Fukuyama, for example, in this passage I read to you, talks about Nigeria as an example where it's, there's intergroup violence. And I'm, I don't know much about Nigeria. I don't know if it's about race, but I think the issue of the Philippines is less about uh, race in that sense. Uh, I mean, you know, all these things are intermingled, um, but, but it's about class. So again, like, you know, upper classes tend to be of mixed descent. Tendency, tendency, not always true. Or as more, I guess, a more humble, people from more humble origins tend to be um, pure or quote unquote pure. But I, I really I really want to evolve away from these kinds of discussions, but it's something we do have to talk about, unfortunately. Hopefully we can get to a point where it doesn't matter what your skin color, your, your ethnicity is, you're Filipino. So this is what I'm talking about. What What is a Filipino? So uh, for me, it's, it shouldn't be about ethnicity. It should be about ideals. And I really, and this is why I really, I really like that Rizal is our national hero because he was just so ahead of his time in his thinking, his accomplishments, and he had a very cosmopolitan worldview, at least for the time. And I think that's what we have to have. We have to have a cosmopolitan worldview, or at least a thing where it's, that's not a view, a worldview that's, that's not racially based, and it's based on proper values. So and again, it starts, it starts from people's actions, and it has to start from the top. Um, so. That's my whole thing, as you know. Um, I've mentioned before that um, I, I want to start marketing like something for the 
top of society, um, 1%, starting with the 1% of the 1%, then moving down all the way throughout the educated classes. Like, there has to be, you know, for me, the there has to be a shared set of values and practices and uh, culture, um, customs, you know, um, uh, manners, those things really, I mean, I know these things are, are, sound, are maybe amorphous to you or they're very intangible, but these things actually matter because at the end of the day, so societies, institutions are run by people. They are run by human beings. So I'll give you an example of, of how there's no sense of, how this sort of no sense of nation manifests in our society. So a friend of mine was in BGC uh, the, other, the other night, and he lined up to a, uh, there was a long line for this. Uh, I guess it's, it's a bakery in BGC, like it's apparently bringing in some really famous uh, banana pie from New York. And I forget, forget the name. Um, maybe if you, any of you know, you can email it to me. But I forget the name, but it's pretty new. It's in BGC. And he's lining up and like the lady in front of him pays by credit card. And then before she signs, she, she gets a call on her cell phone and and basically uh, just starts talking and talking on her cell phone without signing. So, like, everyone's waiting for her. And he was telling me, because he's a foreigner, uh, he was saying, like, in, in my country, it's a developed country, like, he would get killed if you did this, which is true. Like, I lived abroad, and, and I'm sure many of you have as well. Like, it, that would never happen abroad. Like, there's just some basic things that b behavior that sh – that, we shouldn't tolerate and this is just a flavor a flagrant example of someone just not giving a shit about about other people and it's just an educated i mean theoretically educated but at least wealthy person i mean remember this is bgc this person's talking on the phone and it's just not caring about everyone else waiting in line someone else and i brought this up with someone else and this other person told me that there was one time he was waiting at Alabang Town Center, and uh, this lady, which is there at the, you know, the, you know the rotunda that goes in from Madrigal Avenue, she was just waiting there in her car, and like <laughs> just sitting and waiting for whoever, and just like texting on her phone, and like she held back the entire all the traffic, like she like did not care. You you're not supposed to do that, like just like waiting in the car in the middle of the of the of the driveway like that. And these are ostensibly educated people, but at the very least, they have money. So maybe money, but no class. I don't know. So a lot of people like to talk about, you know, like there's that there was that picture. I remember that went viral maybe a year or two ago about uh, in Edsa. There was this bus just like waiting there for people and was holding up all the traffic. And there was like literally like no trap. There were no moving cars in front of it because there was it was like one or two buses just holding up the entire four lanes of Edsa. Um, so yeah, that happens with the poor, but it also happens with the rich. So this is like a nationwide problem that has to be fixed. So again, we have to find, we have to create a sense of professionalism and uh, courtesy. There we go, courtesy and manners and impartiality before we even talk about things like um, federalism versus unitarianism, um, parliamentary versus presidential. Like those are level, those are like the next step. Those are level two things to talk about. Because again, even if these laws are passed, I mean, are they going to be uh, done correctly? Are people going to follow them? I mean, there's there's no point if, if you pass all these laws and nothing happens. Although the things they are meant to fix aren't being fixed. Um, let's see. I think I I think that's it for today's episode. Um, yeah. So my plan again is to really start marketing a sense of what is Filipino, starting with the upper classes. And you know me, uh, it, has to, it has to be with the culture of old Manila. Uh, because people like it, I like it, and that's, frankly speaking, as, an, as a nation, that was our zenith. Okay. All right. So marketing, 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 marketing. And I'm going to talk about it more in future episodes. All right. Today's Spanish Tagalog vocab. Bansa, nación, or nación, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Bansa, nación, nation. Fits with the episode. Bansa, in Tagalog, is nación en español. All right, that's it. 
I will see you next week. Uh, until then, mag-ingat kayo. Hasta luego.